All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome again to our Apiculture Online Hive Chat with NC State. My name is David Tarpey. I'm here with the NC State Apiculture Program and members uh, at, at NC State, as well as uh, many representatives of the NCDA apiary inspectors. Uh, welcome to all of those of you that are watching us on our uh, streaming uh, YouTube channel. Be sure to, um, to like us, be sure to subscribe, that helps a lot, um, and, uh, and leave comments if you have any questions. Um, we're really lucky to have um, a, uh, a set of guests tonight. Um, we have uh, Dr. Mike Waldvogel, who is uh, at, N at, at NC State, and he's uh, the Extension Specialist in Urban Entomology, uh, as well as uh, Representative Sidney Ross from the NCDA who is in their pesticide division. And so we're gonna have a, a nice lengthy chat about um, backyard mosquito abatement programs and, and other issues uh, dealing with that. Um, even though mosquitoes perhaps aren't at their height right now, um, they, they really still are a, a major issue. And it's just something that, that we as beekeepers really need to, to educate ourselves about. So we're gonna, we're gonna learn a lot this evening. But first, uh, as usual, we always start out with um, our first segment and talking about um, <clears throat> bees in season. And that is uh, what your bees are doing right now and what you should be doing as a beekeeper in order to help them as best that you can. And so, as you very well know, um, the season is winding down and, and it's, uh, it's getting very, very close to, to being over. The height of the Varroa monitoring season is pretty much uh, past us. Um, you know, if it, it's not, it's never too late to monitor if you can get into your bees. That is, measure how many mites per bee or the percentage of mites within your colony. That's really important. But if you haven't taken any control measures or if you haven't done anything or if you're asking what is a Varroa mite, um, it's pretty much too late really to to do much about that now. And you're just gonna have to let fate take its course. Um, because of that, actually I've been hearing a lot of kind of anecdotal reports of, of early premature die-offs, um, mostly in colonies where, where beekeepers don't have real active monitoring or, or control plans for varroa mites. So um, it is the number one predictor of having problems this time of year and, and through the winter. So um, just make sure that uh, um, you're staying on top of your bees. But uh, by and large, what we can talk about is what you need to do to get your hives and your colonies ready for winter. Um, and so we'll just kind of briefly go over this. Um, others can chime in, of course, because there's lots of little kind of tricks of the trade. But in general, if you read, uh, most of the textbooks out there, most of the textbooks are centered around more Northern beekeeping rather than beekeeping in the Southeast. Um, but some of the, many of the, of the different things that you need to do still apply. So one thing um, is make sure that your hive is level. Um, that's something that, um, you know, over the summer and kind of as the soil shifts or if you don't have, you know, sturdy hive stands or things like that, your hives can, can tilt. And so you need to sh put a shim in there or, or otherwise kind of level them. But you also need to make sure that the, that the entrance is tilted down slightly so that especially this time of year and through the winter when rain comes, you don't want it tilting upward so that the rain comes in and then pools up inside, um, inside the hive. So you want them level um, side to side, but you want them tilted up just slightly about five degrees or so um, to make sure that, uh, that uh, water isn't going to accumulate. And then you also wanna put a strap on the lid or otherwise put a brick on the lid or something. You're not gonna be going in too much. So you put a cinder block on there to prevent wind from blowing off and those kind of things that can really help as well. It is really, really critical that you remove all queen excluders. Uh, nothing will kill a colony during the winter more readily than uh, having a queen excluder where the cluster moves throughout the combs over the weeks and months of the winter, but then the queen gets stuck below and gets left behind. The cluster moves above the queen excluder and the queen can't and, and they're doomed. Um, you can also remove 
pretty much most feeders, especially um, uh, fr the front feeders, uh, Boardman feeders, you can leave in if you put them uh, way out on the side. Um, top hive feeders, you can keep on if you wish, but you can also uh, remove the feeders if you want, um, depending on how mild versus how severe the the winter is that that can um, you want to the, the colder the winter is that you probably want to um, remove the feeders more likely than not. Um, introduce your entrance reducers. So this right here is an entrance reducer on a on a bottom board. Um, a lot of people put the entrance reducer. They either put the the large slot on the entrance, um, and or they put. The, the, the hole of that entrance reducer on the bottom. And actually what you wanna do is you wanna do it like you seen here where the little notch is pointing upwards. And why is that important? It's because if uh, the bees die off in the cluster and they litter the bottom board, you don't have you know, the same activity really that you do during the active season where those undertaker bees bring out you know, the, the, the dead bees from the hive. And so they can pile up right at the entrance there. And if they get wet and or frozen, then they can actually clog that entrance, making it um, really difficult, if not impossible for the bees to get out. So if you have the notch where it's actually um, upwards, then any um, dead bees that uh, might be getting in the way are actually kind of below and, and they're still able to get out. Um, one other thing to do too is, um, and again, this is a preference, not necessarily an absolute, but uh, reverse the inner cover, right? So that, that little notch is down. So you just wanna flip over the inner cover on the very top of, of the hive. So that, um, that helps for uh, the chimney effect of the ventilation to, to keep some uh, airflow so that moisture doesn't build up and then freeze on the combs, which is a really, really bad thing during the winter cluster. And also, again, not really a common around here in the Southeast, but it can provide uh, an upper entrance if that bottom entrance gets clogged because of snow or dead bees or anything else. So that, um, that can give them an, an extra escape. So those are the things that you wanna do to the hive, that is the house, right, in which your bees are, are living. But these are some of the things that you wanna keep in mind when you want to winterize for your colonies. Uh, one of the things is um, hopefully you've been feeding your bees if they've been light, right? Hopefully they have plenty of honey stores, but if not, um, we can assist the bees in making sure that they get enough honey for the winter by placing um, you know, sugar water on them that they can then convert very quickly into honey. In doing so, make sure it's as a heavy syrup, about a, as thick as you can make it, two parts sugar to one part water um, is about as thick as you can make it. So that um, gives them less work to do to have to dry all of that out and then convert it into honey. Um, one thing that you don't wanna do is you don't wanna have a lot of empty space. Right, so you wanna remove as much empty comb as possible. So you don't wanna double deep like this where you have the, the bees and the brood and the cluster here and then honey, and then this entire box just being empty. Just remove that entire box and knock them down into one story if you need to. If you have two you know, kind of medium sized colonies, um, it can often be a lot better and a lot easier to unite them right now using the newspaper method um, have them overwinter as kind of a, a larger colony with more resources. And then next spring, they're gonna be much more likely to survive. And then you can split them back into two or probably even more hives. So it's a heck of a lot better to overwinter one larger colony than it is to try to nurse two weak colonies through the winter. Um, the last thing to do is make sure that um, the cluster, the bees, the brood, any remaining brood um, are all down below the main honey stores, right? So you want the, the cluster to start out low and then they slowly move over and then up and then over again. Um, and so you, if the cluster starts up, they have a tendency to wanna keep going up plus hot air rises. So that's actually a lot better um, for, for the bees during cluster. And so when you're setting up your 
hive, uh, make sure that the colony inside that hive is down below and then you have a good 35 to 50 pounds at least of honey above that cluster in addition to whatever might be in and around uh, the combs within the cluster itself. Any other uh, comments from the gallery? Any other pieces of advice that, that you guys are, uh, are giving right now? All right, hearing none. <laughs> um, again, one of the things that we as beekeepers really need to um, think about in order to help our bees is always looking one to two brood cycles ahead. So that's about three to six weeks from now, because what we do now is being done in, you know, to look ahead, you know, one to two brood cycles from now. And so, you know, three to six weeks from now around Thanksgiving, you're probably not going to be going into your bees very much, um, at least certainly not as frequently. You certainly can when it's warm enough weather, um, you can go in and, and check on them, um, especially when uh, it's above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't even have to go inside the hive. You can just go check on your hive, look for flight activity. Bees will still be flying. They'll be taking evacuation flights where they need to go relieve themselves. They'll be checking for uh, nectar and, and pollen sources, which will be rare you know, and far and few between. But nonetheless, they still will be um, flying, um, not quite as active as during the, the um, summer season, but they'll, they'll still be flying. Um, if it's below that temperature, on, even on colder days, you can go and, and regularly check on your bees. You can put your ear up against the side of the hive. You can hear them buzzing in there. You might even knock a little bit and, and see if they kind of buzz back. If you know the hive is totally cold, you don't see any activity, you don't hear anything inside, um, it's very possible that, um, that the, the cluster is just not doing well. You don't necessarily wanna go in um, when it's cold to check on a potential dead out, wait for one of those warmer days to go and see if the colony is, is still in there. Um, if it is over the winter, you wanna make sure that you remove that from, from your apiary, remove that equipment before it gets robbed out uh, by any other remaining hives around. And so with that, a uh, very quick primer on uh, winterizing. I'd like to turn it over to my, to my colleague, Mike Waldvogel. Um, Mike has uh, been here, well, I don't even wanna say, he's newly retired, let's just say. Uh, he's newly retired. Uh, but he's been a real stalwart of uh, urban entomology and extension here in the entomology and plant pathology um, department. And uh, his main area is uh, urban entomology and crawling under uh, crawl spaces of houses and um, looking at bed bugs and termites and ants and all sorts of other things. But where kind of our worlds overlap and where we've done a lot of work together and, and, and collaborative thinking is the issue of mosquito spraying. Mosquitoes are obviously an urban pest. Um, and so there's a lot of issue uh, dealing with mosquitoes, which um, often comes into conflict with bees and beekeeping. And so Mike, I'll turn it over to you. I'll stop sharing so that you can share it and uh, welcome to Apiculture Online. Okay. Thank you, David. Let me see if I can get this. So can everyone see that? I'm assuming. Looks great. Looks awesome. Okay. So as David said, I appreciate that. I'm actually not retired yet. Uh, that doesn't occur till December. I hung in there to make sure Sydney got here first. But I do handle a lot of calls about mosquitoes. As David mentioned, we're kind of winding down the season, but people are still getting their yards treated for uh, mosquitoes. And I get the two sides of the coin. I get people that call me up and say, what can I use to eradicate mosquitoes? And I'm gonna, I usually tell them you need a, a real tank full of wishful thinking because that ain't gonna happen anytime soon. You can manage mosquitoes to some extent, but you're not gonna get rid of them. And they're not always happy with that answer, but I don't get paid to make people happy. I just tell them the truth sometimes. On the other hand, people call up that say, you know, my neighbor has hired a company to come in and spray or they are spraying. And maybe they're just genuinely just concerned in general about 
what is the impact of these sprays on beneficial insects, such as honeybees? And they're usually the first one they mention, which is no surprise. But they also ask things like, how does it affect fireflies, ladybugs, butterflies, and things like that? So that's where things get confusing. And it was a little over a year ago that another colleague of ours, Dr. Michael Reiskin, and I did a story with the News and Observer. And the reporter asked, you know, do these backyard mosquito sprays also affect good bugs like bees? Well, you know, that's kind of a duh question. We know that if you look at broadly at these insecticides, you know, most of them, with few exceptions, can have a negative impact on honeybees, the adulticides, ones that are sprayed for adult mosquitoes. So we do see that happen. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And in general, pyrethroid insecticides, I'm going to give you a quick lesson in pesticide chemistry. Most of what is used in residential properties for mosquitoes are what we call the pyrethroid insecticides. So the OID there tells you, if you remember, um, you know, like with the Android, I'm not talking about your phone, but if you're a science fiction fan, Android made synthetic or artificial person. So the pyrethroids are a synthetic version of chemicals that mimic the activity of pyrethrin. So going back to basic chemistry, we have what is called pyrethrum, which comes from the flowers of a particular chrysanthemum plant. Um, those contain these six molecules that are called pyrethrins. And over time, chemists have warped those into different forms and come up with these pyrethroids. And they tend to be more persistent. The nice thing about the pyrethrins was they have a quick knockdown and then they dissipate quickly from the environment. On the other side, people said, well, that's nice, but I need something that has a longer life in terms of controlling a pest. At the same time, also, we have people saying the longer it's out there, the more likely something could go wrong and have an adverse effect on something such as beneficials. So that is where we stand with, we're using chemicals that can have this adverse effect. What becomes important is really understanding the label, especially David asked me to talk about how do you go about convincing your neighbors to be kinder and gentler, so to speak. And you really have to get down to understanding the label. So I've got a couple I'm gonna use here and. Just as with any caveat, I point out that the label I'm using here is just an example. It's not a product I necessarily dislike or like the best of all. No one's giving me money to mention their name, but it's a good example of a kind of label you want to look at. So this one, of course, contains a chemical called bifenthrin right there. It tells you in all the pyrethroids, with few exceptions, end in THRIN. So you see permethrin, lambda cyhalothrin. Delta methrin, things like that. That usually tells you it's a pyrethroid insecticide. If you're curious about or want to know what effect this has on bees, that is under the section called environmental hazards. So when you go to the, the label, you'll see that. Usually it mentions the effects on aquatic organisms, particularly fish. But further down, you will see the part that talks about bees. And there's two important things to think about in this perspective. There's two opportunities for bees to come into contact with the chemicals. The first one is obviously when it's being sprayed. The second one is long after it's been sprayed and when the chemical is dried on that surface, they go and visit a plant that's in bloom and they, they pick up a lethal dose from the residual chemical that is on the surface of that plant. And so those two things vary quite significantly. So when you look at this particular label right here, you notice that it says the product is highly toxic to bees. So we go with highly toxic, moderately toxic, sort of toxic, they come up with different categories. But the important thing to know is that when they're highly toxic, there's a bit of additional concerns with those products in general. But we, this is a good example of a product where we have the high toxicity when the bees are exposed to direct treatment, that is while it's being applied, but also to the res, potential residues that are on blooming crops or weeds. So that again is the double whammy effect with this type of chemical. And it warns you there, do not apply this product or allow it to drift. You'll see that allow it to drift statement show up whenever you have a pesticide that says it's highly toxic to bees. Because not only are we concerned about the crop or the plants that we are treating, but what's the potential for that to drift off site and affect other nearby plants that are in bloom, which are also going to attract bees as well. So it tells you do not apply the product or allow it to drift to blooming crops if bees are foraging the treatment area. So the point there is it doesn't mean the bees necessarily have to be there at the time you're spraying, but if you spray it for upwards of more than eight plus hours, you could have a toxic effect on the, on the bees that land on those treated surfaces. 
So that's why it's very important to look at that section of the, of the label. Now let's take one that's slightly different from that. Uh, this is a product called OneGuard. Again, it's just one that I found that has a slightly different label. This one actually has two different pyrethroid components in it, as well as other ingredients. Pyroproxifen is an insect growth regulator. But the primary ingredient in this particular product is called lambda cyhalothrin. And that's broadly used in a lot of areas as well. But the unique thing about this label, when we look at that section under environmental hazards, you notice that it says that this product is also highly toxic to bees, which again means we're not only just concerned about what we're treating, but where the chemical could go offside if it drifts. But it, the problem is mainly high toxicity when bees are exposed to direct treatment on those blooming crops or weeds. And so it tells you not to allow the product or to apply it, the product or allow it to drift to blooming crops or weeds while the bees are actively foraging. So the distinction there is if you're all out there to do your treatment and you see bees visiting flowers, the uh, scientific term for it is, uh-uh, you ain't gonna do it. So that's the difference here is this one has a slightly less residual effect on the bees. So the main concern is, you know, treating wild bees are actually visiting those plants. So you can think of there, there's some options there to reduce the risk of exposure of the bees to those pesticides. And just to contrast it again, that's where you see the wording. So there's the bifenthrin where the concern was not just the direct treatment, but also residues that may be on those blooming crops or weeds. So that's the slight difference from them, but there's a recurring theme here that both of them say the same thing. Whoop, let me back up for a second. You know, people say, well, what are my options then? It's pretty simple. It just says, don't apply it to anything that's in bloom. That ain't complicated to figure out. So you treat plants that aren't in bloom, you're fine. Anything that's in bloom, you avoid it. And you try to avoid treating right adjacent to it. Because again, with both of these particular products, because they're highly toxic to bees, we're concerned about the drift issue. So not only do you have to be concerned about that, but you have to worry about how can these things drift off site. Um, so people ask me, well, what other options can there be? Well, there are other products that are out there. And this is an example of one. This is a product that contains essential oils. You can see right there, it has rosemary oil, geraniol, and peppermint oil. Um, it is listed, it's what we call a FIFRA 25B product. That's a special dis, uh, distinction under FIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide Rodenticide uh, Act, or, uh, yeah, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. That's a trivial pursuit question. 25B means that it is actually exempt from registration with the EPA. You're not required to do that. However, one important distinction with these products is, while the EPA says it may not have to be registered, the pesticide, North Carolina pesticide law doesn't take that perspective. We have a law in North Carolina that says whether or not the product is registered with the, with the EPA, if you say it's a pesticide, it has to be registered with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And I think that's a very valuable asset that we have in play here. So people ask me, does this product kill bees? Because they think it's safe because it's essential oils. Well, not necessarily. Again, it's how you're applying it. If you actually look on the label of how you can apply it for outdoor use and look at this section where it says perimeter treatments and recreational areas, you can see that one of the, pro the insects you can control with it are bees. So you kind of scratch your head, but you think about a different perspective here because what you're doing here is your target of your application is bees. So let's say you did have a scenario where you had bees inside a wall and you just couldn't coax them out and you may be up against the wall in terms of, no pun intended, having to get rid of them. How do you go out doing that? You could use this kind of a product. So if you're targeting bees specifically to kill them, this product will work. If you're spraying in general over foliage of plants to try to control mosquitoes, you have a little bit broader window where it may not have as much of an impact, but the chemical definitely can kill bees. So you always wanna bear that in mind when you use it. There are some other products out there. Again, some of them aren't quite as effective at controlling mosquitoes. So it's kind of a trade-off. So David asked me to wrap up by talking about how do you talk to your neighbors? Well, it does boil down to communication versus confrontation. And we prefer the former, not the latter. So if your idea of talking to your neighbors is putting a sign like this outside, this is a 
right out in front of the house of a friend of uh, both David and I. She lives right near campus. If that's the extent of your conversation with your neighbor, you're on the fast track to nowhere. That's not going to accomplish anything. You have to do more than simply remind them. But this is a good reminder to them and to whoever comes in and treats the yard instead that you are concerned about sprays harming pollinators. And they need to bring their A game when they're treating your neighbor's property as well. So it is good to have that out there, but you need to go far further than simply that. So one of the things to do is, um, is ask some questions. And some people say, well, I've gone up and talked to the company treating their yard and they, don't, they seem to be reluctant to talk to me. Well, from their perspective, they're dealing with their customer. If you have questions about their customer's property, go ask their customer. They're not there to answer those questions. So it may seem like they're being evasive. They may try to ask you if you're looking for a service, but think about talking to your neighbor first. And there are simple questions that you wanna ask is like, what are they using? If they're doing it themselves, they went and bought the product at like an Ace Hardware or Lowe's or something, they should know what they bought. On the other hand, if they hired a company, they should also know what's being used because they need to know what is being sprayed on their property. So they should make sure that they know what that chemical, that company was using. You know, where are they treating specifically? Are they treating the entire yard? What are they concentrating on? Where are your hives located relative to that? So for example, right here, if they're treating just on the other side of this, these shrubs and you've got a hive right here, then you have to be somewhat concerned about that. And more importantly, when are they treating? We have had instances where in one case, a company did tell a homeowner, well, we only treat early in the morning because the bees aren't active. Well, not quite because they got behind schedule when it rained and so they were out there at noon treating. So I remind them to always tell the truth. Um, make sure you explain to them something about your bees. Where are your bees located? For example, if they are right close to the wall right here and their properties here, is there a possibility chemical could drift? You want the person doing the spraying to also know that and be aware of that. Um, when and how are the bees active? You know, they're not out really early in the morning. They're still drinking their coffee, getting ready to watch the news and head out for the day after that. Remind them that there is a window of opportunity to treat that doesn't involve the bee activity. And then this is your opportunity to explain to them what I just told you is what does the label say about protecting bees? Can they pick products that avoid harming bees to whatever extent possible? There may be some bees dying by direct exposure, but what can they do to reduce that risk of, a, of endangering the bees? Um, so you may ask them, you know, can you use a product that reduces the risk to bees? Like between the two products I showed you, obviously one that where the risk is greatest for direct exposure, you can try to time your spray when the bees are not active. When you have a residual play into that, you have to be a little bit more careful. Can they pick a product like those um, essential oils? where you're less likely to have that kind of effect. Um, if they've got an area like this where they've got water, you know, you obviously you're not gonna spray that with an insecticide, but you have the option to use things like mosquito dunks, which have no effect on bees. They specifically harm only the bees themselves, oh, excuse me, only the, the mosquitoes themselves. Um, can they avoid spraying on or near flowering plants? Well, that is on the label, but you're not trying to say, hey, stupid, read the label. You wanna be a little bit polite at least to some extent, but say, can you really make an effort not to even spray near them? Because those products, if they drift onto those flowers can still cause a problem. And think about other sensitive areas near, including your hive. Do they know where your hive is? Where is the prevailing wind going? Is it gonna direct that spray towards those hives and can they redirect it another way? Uh, the other thing is something like a bird bath. They think it's strictly for birds, but you also know in the middle of the summertime, that's hot work out there foraging. That's why I don't do it. But the bees may stop off here to get, well, it's their version of a cool one, I guess. They stop off to drink up water. If that water contains chemical that was sprayed that morning, you may find out that you've got bees dying right there. So it's a good thing to remind them that if they've got a bird bath or something that your bees may take advantage of, perhaps it's a good idea before it's sprayed to empty it out. Also cover it with a trash bag so that even if that area is sprayed, you can avoid can contaminate. You still want to flush it out there, keep the birds happy at the same time. So these are the kind of things you want to address with your, your neighbors where possible. Um, the other thing to remind them is that everyone has to work towards getting rid of bees, oh, excuse me, getting rid of mosquitoes. Um, and that includes the whole neighborhood. 
So people often have, they're all often their own worst enemy, just like this. So if you have things like this in your yard, you may be contributing to the problem as well. If you got a bird bath that looks like that, I don't know any birds that are going to bathe in it. They're probably going to look at you, go over and crap on your car for leaving it this nasty. But if you have something in your backyard, you make your own bee boxes, so you have a pile of lumber, you got a tarp here, you're collecting water, that is a breeding site. Let me back up for a second. So what I remind people is that mosquito control is a community effort. I always say that when it comes to mosquito control, it takes a village. It only takes the village idiot to screw up by not doing their part to fix it. And if that, you don't succeed with that, that's when you call our friends with the NCDA and I'll segue over to letting David invite our next speaker who is really good at her job. Thank you, my wow, there's so much information in that. Um, everybody make sure you go back and, and view the, uh, the recording several times too. That is really great information, Mike. Let's uh, keep that conversation going. Before, before we do turn it over to Sydney, there, there was one question from the YouTube uh, viewers that I think is pertinent and, and before we move on might want to address here and that those mosquito traps, the Spartan mosquito traps, I'd never heard of those, but um, other mosquito traps that use yeast and salt or other ingredients, are they safe for bees and are they, um, are they good alternatives um, or you know, are they um, just one, one option? There, I, I would say more there. I've never seen any data that suggests that they trap bees because that would certainly be a flag if they attracted you know, beneficial insects into them. They're really designed to have, use chemicals that are going to attract bees. In, uh, excuse, keep screwing up there. They are designed to attract mosquitoes to them. So like with anything else, a trap has its limits as to what, how valuable it's gonna be. Um, a lot of the early traps, it depends upon how many you deployed in your yard. So my perspective is it's not a bad addition because the more insects you get out of the picture, the better off you're going to be. Okay. No, that's very helpful. Very helpful. Plenty of other questions though. So, um, but we'll get to that in the Q and A, but first, um, you know, let me, let me introduce Sydney Ross, who is, as Mike alluded to in uh, the pesticide division of the NCDA. Um, and you've been there, how long you've been there, Sydney? I have been there for uh, almost four years. For four years, so you're you're an uh, an old veteran at this point, um, and uh, you are pretty much the point person when it comes to uh, these these and other issues. And so, as Mike was saying, um, when these issues arise, uh, call and and notify the NCDA, and you're that person. So. Um, what are what are some of the more common calls and questions that you get when it comes to this uh, issue of mosquito spraying and backyard beekeeping? Yeah, so um, in terms of all of the kind of outdoor pest control issues that we face, all of those calls kind of come directly to my phone. So if you ever call into us, you're going to directly get me. Um, in terms of what we see, I would say primarily the biggest thing with mosquito sprays is that I will get a call from a beekeeper asking if we require notification. So they want to know if that pesticide applicator will be required to notify them before they make that application, um, which I'm guessing might be a good time for me to go ahead and answer that too. Um, sure. I would say, you know, in most cases, no, that notification is not required. Um, generally, we kind of leave that up to the individual that has kind of hired them to perform that service and additionally, the applicator. So sometimes pesticide applicators will come out and they'll actually, um, you know, look on field watch. They do what they're kind of supposed to do or what we hope that they would do. And they'll notice that there's a beehive there and they'll attempt to make contact with that beekeeper before the application occurs. And it could just, you know, also be the alternative to that, which is that they're going to leave a door hanger on the door of that person that they applied for. And that might be it. But I would say mainly the biggest call I get is kind of a frantic, you know, they're out here, they're spraying, what do I do? Um, this kind of leads me to something that Dr. Waldvogel already mentioned, which is that I do get a, the unfortunate call about having a difficult confrontation with a pesticide applicator. Um, my 
biggest advice to you would be to, you know, primarily if let's say you see that there's somebody out there spraying right near your beehives, you know, of course, time is of the essence, but also kind of, you know, make sure that you're collected and you're calm when you go to speak with them. Um, they are kind of out there doing their daily, you know, eight to five job. And so to have somebody kind of come up there and get very upset with them right away can um, kind of start you off on the wrong foot. So like Dr. Waldvogel said, you know, approach them calmly and nicely, ask them what it is they're spraying, and then explain that you have a beehive nearby. So um, there was a question on the YouTube uh, chat that was asking about what are some of those things to reduce drift? What, what are some of those things that you can calmly ask that PCO to, to do in order to avoid that, that type of drift? Yeah, so I guess that the primarily the first thing would be to, you know, identify that your beehives are there. Um, secondarily, kind of just ask what it is that they're spraying. And then, you know, and I will say that Dr. Waldvogel pretty much already covered this in a really great way, which is, you know, ask them what the goal of their application is. Are they going to be applying to, you know, just the larger, more wooded areas of the backyard? Are they there to kind of apply to the entire premises? Um, also, you know, go ahead and kind of point out that your bees are foraging and make note of what time they're there on site. If let's say they are there during the active hours, it might be good to even, you know, ask if you can have the name of their company, have the name of their supervisor, because that is something that, you know, a lot of times these folks are out there just kind of doing the job that they're employed at. They might actually not have too much control over what it is that they're applying and, you know, when they're applying, they're you know, out there being hired by somebody who owns that business. So it's good to kind of talk to the manager of that business and maybe ask them those questions directly because unfortunately our applicators don't always know too much in terms of the in-depth questions, although we really hope that they do. <laughs> yes. Well, and maybe that conversation can help prompt that, you know, kind of education. I mean, I think just knowing that the beehive is there, right? Like, as I always say, nobody wants to kill bees unless... It's Mike's example of a, a pest colony inside your woodwork or behind your chimney or something, right? But um, nobody wants to kill bees. So just knowing that the beehives are there are often, you know, more, more than enough. Um, so, you know, how, you know, we have estimated 100,000 um, honeybee colonies here in North Carolina, 15,000 beekeepers um, and lots of people who are spraying their backyards. Uh, how many calls do you get a year? How many incidents do you, do, you know, I mean, um, you have a full-time job, so, you know, obviously uh, um, this and other things keep you busy, but, you know, like put it into perspective of how often is this really truly an issue of having problems with bees? Yeah, so um, it is interesting because, of course, you know, taking the scope that I take all of the pesticide related complaints for outdoor use in the whole state. So it's not always going to be just about bees or just about, you know, issues that beekeepers might be facing. But I would say, you know, um, we probably get about maybe between 20 or so, like 15 to 20 um, in that kind of height of the season. So in that, you know, few months during summer, but then beyond that, I'll still get sporadic calls. And I'd say I probably get about maybe one or two calls in the off season that are about bees. Um, I also occasionally will get some calls that I forward over to our um, plant industry divisions apiary section, because we do just get general calls about that as well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up earlier, and this is something that um, I do get a lot of calls about and can be specifically a, a bigger concern to beekeepers. Um, if you're in a more rural area, we oftentimes will get calls about aerial pesticide applications. Oh, right, yeah. um, that would be the biggest thing that um, is a, a very large concern for us. Um, yeah, so explain yeah. that because we're still in the hurricane season and mos mosquito abatement programs following hurricanes is another um, issue where these two things um, can come to head. So um, how does that work compared to just kind of the, the site on site uh, instance like we've been talking about? 
Yeah, so um, with our, you know, public health applications, and then also with just kind of our agricultural aerial applications, these are both kind of large concerns for beekeepers. Um, primarily, the biggest thing that I would always recommend to do is get on Field Watch, which is our voluntary um, program where you can register where your beehives are located. Um, but beyond that, um, please register your beehives with the state. If you are interested in doing that and you haven't done so already, it's really straightforward. You pretty much just fill out a form. It gets sent over to our plant industry division and it's $10 a year. Um, you have to re-register each year around December 31st at the end of the year. But um, if let's say you fill this out, then aerial applicators are actually required by law to notify you that their applications are occurring. Um, the notification period is between 10 days all the way up to 48 hours before that application occurs so that you have time to kind of prepare and decide how you'd like to deal with, deal with that. Yeah. Um, so that would be the biggest kind of, I guess, question that I get is, are they required to notify me if it's an aerial application? And if you do register with the state, then yes. Um, Unfortunately, FieldWatch is very much just voluntary, but what we recommend is that all of these aerial folks actually go on and try to sync their GPS with our FieldWatch maps. That way they know where the beehives are. Um, beyond that, in terms of our more public health focused applications, we have had really good success with especially people on the eastern side of our state who work within the public health sector actually looking at the field watch map and even though it is voluntary giving our beekeepers a call and saying hey you know we are thinking about doing a county-wide aerial application for mosquitoes following this hurricane so i have heard some really great success stories there so that's really wonderful um but it <clears throat> excuse me, pretty much happens on a county by county basis. Um, while I was an inspector, I had the opportunity to be involved in more counties um, decision whether or not they wanted to do a countywide spray. And it was very interesting because, you know, we have some folks within those southern sort of center cluster of counties that were definitely going to spray and they did those, you know, countywide sprays. But then, for example, with Moore County, they ended up not going that route. And alternatively, they just went out and, you know, did our insect growth regulator dunks that Dr. Waldvogel showed in kind of our larger areas um, where there was standing water from the hurricane. And then beyond that, they had some smaller applications that were made on the ground. So really just depends on where you live. And it's always great to, you know, you can call our division and we can kind of talk to them for you if you'd like, or just kind of directly contact your public health um, division within your county. Right. And so just, just to be clear, so there, there's two things that you'd like to see internested. One is the registering uh, is it by apiary? Is it by beehive or is it by beekeeper with, with the NCDA? And then there's the voluntary mapping system that you use, the field watch, right? Those are, are separate things, but you can, if you're kind of locating the same the sites of where your bees are, they can work well together. Is that correct? Yeah, so Field Watch is um, something that is totally voluntary. It's an online program. You can go to um, Field Watch and just look that up online and it'll bring you there. And what it is, is basically a mapping system where you go, you know, by beehive, you can mark down where your beehives are. And this and this is our voluntary system. Um, it's really great for our ground applicators. Um, and we do actually have some guys who will request that share file and we'll send it over to them and they sync it up with their GPS, which is really wonderful. That's how we want the program to work. Right. But beyond that, our plant industry division has state registration for beekeepers. So you can register all of your hives or let's say your you know apiaries on there and there's an opportunity at the bottom of that form to kind of identify who the farmers are within your area that way we know that you're in more of an agricultural or rural area and then we'll actually take that form from the apiary division and that comes straight to my desk and i work with the folks in our licensing division and we will try to locate farmers within your area and then go ahead and send them out a letter that basically just says, hey, you have a beekeeper with some beehives located here. If you are going to be doing an aerial application, you are required to notify them. 
but it's really important that you register with the state because otherwise we will not know that you're there. And beyond that, you know, the aerial applicators won't really know that you're there either unless they are looking at that voluntary map. Yeah. So registration, you get that proactive uh, service from you guys of notifying, you know, growers and, and others. Whereas the, the field watch and the drift watch is a voluntary thing. So if the pest control company um, is using that, then that's great. But if they're not, they're not required to, right? So just make that clear. Um, yeah, I didn't, oh, I was, sorry. I was going to tell you that in terms of our numbers, you know, we've got like tons of folks who've signed up for Field Watch. I think it's around like 13,000 beekeepers within our state. It's a ton. Um, but in terms of our apiary registration that's formal through the state, I think we only have about 30 people yeah. each year who do yeah. it. So I really am just trying to get the word out that really it would be a great thing to do if you're willing to spare $10 and about <laughs> like 20 minutes of your yeah. time. And you can always call me and I'll help you fill it out or Glenn Hackney over at um, the apiary section can help you out with that too. And that's why I wanted to make that distinction, right? Because I think people sign up for Field Watch and they think that that's registering and it's exactly. not quite one and the same. So I just want to make sure that, that there's kind of a, a, a formal way and then a voluntary way. And so just make sure th that you do both uh, on those. Um, so the, for the last uh, segment, the last 15 minutes, we're just going to kind of open it up to uh, and continue this question and answer session. Th thank you again, Sydney, for for joining this discussion. Um, and Mike, I'll kind of bring you back in and everybody else who, who wants to join in as well. Um, there's, there was a comment here about um, getting back to that um, issue of the communication, right? And that one of the problems with uh, the, the PCOs in, in backyards is that oftentimes they're just very reluctant to, to talk. Um, that underscores, Mike, what you were saying about, you know, bo both of you making sure that you go in and being very nice and kind. I always like to say a, jo a jar of your honey goes a long way, right? Um, so bringing a jar of honey over, not le um, letting that get defensive, but there's not really much of an incentive for them to want to talk and they often push it off on um, higher ups or, or other things. And so, you know, other than a jar of honey, um, you know, what, what are some of the tactics that you think to, to really make sure that that communication can, can take place in a positive way? That's a good question. You mean talking to the person doing the spraying or to the neighbor? I, I guess, I guess what, you know, what, what is knowing that the, the person who's actually doing the spraying might not want to be engaged as, as Sydney was saying, they might not even feel, um, that it's appropriate for them to be talking to a non-customer, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but then where do you go from there, right? So, um, rather than just throw up your hands, I guess going to the manager and, and, um, and uh, continuing the conversation, right? I, I, I guess that would be the next option because a lot of times, you know, that person may not be very skilled at, with the public. Some of them, the people are good if they're especially into sales, they can sell almost anything. But other technicians may be technically very astute, but aren't good with dealing with the public. And so that's why they may also be reluctant to talk to you. They're worried about saying something that's wrong. And so very often calling the manager, a lot of people don't think to call the manager. I mean, that's what the manager gets paid. To. They, that's the proverbial. They get paid the big bucks, even if they're not that big, to handle those kinds of issues. Because they'd rather talk to you and get it resolved before they get that phone call from the NCDA that may have more ominous tones to arrive at Sydney, she's hopefully gonna be nicer to them. Um, yeah, um, and the, I mean, the alternative is that if you don't want to talk to them at all, you really don't have to. You can yeah. take down my direct phone number, which I'm very happy to provide to you, and I can contact them for you. Yeah. We could get an inspector out there, you know, within probably a matter of, you know, depending upon where they are in relation about an hour or so, from that technician being out there and just kind of, you know, get them out there to be a middleman. So that's also an option. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's great to know. That's great to know. Um, there's another question here, I guess. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. I was going to say that, and that doesn't always mean there's a confrontation. I know right. a lot of inspectors well, and, you know, their job really is, you know, we joke with that I'm with the government, I'm here to help, but it is really, <laughs> I mean, that is what they get paid to do is not simply go out and make one person's life miserable. It's try to find out, uh, you know, 
come up with this happy medium of making sure information, because the more ignorance there is, the more likely something will go wrong. But, you know, if, if you ask the, you know, the other customer, we have, I've seen that go wrong too, where somebody um, asked their neighbor about something and the neighbor got really upset and the company ended up canceling their contract, which was kind of stupid because someone else picked it up immediately. Uh, that's more business tactics and that person probably doesn't need to be in business. But so there's another question, I guess this is uh, more for, for Sydney because she was talking about kind of the, the larger landscape spraying rather than just the backyard one. Um, but for um, spraying for gypsy moth, what, does, what effect does that have on, on, on bees? Yeah, so um, I, I will kind of defer the more toxicology questions probably sure. to Dr. Tarpey, but um, we go through the process of working with our plant industry division to kind of outline a, a plan for them to work on the gypsy moth issue. Um, this includes some spraying. I believe that the chemical that they've decided to use is actually more in the insect growth regulator realm, and it's called SPLAT. If you'd like to look it up, I think it's SPLAT40. Unfortunately, I don't know the um, active that's in there just off the top of my head. I but, believe it's a pheromone. Um, I think, I okay, it's is, is it a pheromone? pheromone. Yep. Yeah, because I wasn't quite sure exactly if... Uh, based off my memory here without pulling that label up in front of me. But um, that being said, you know, they send us about a 90 page plan every year to be reviewed by myself and by my supervisors where they outline um, these areas that they're going to be doing spraying. Um, generally, it's gonna be in more of our kind of rural, um, more mountainous counties up in the northern part of the state, more the northwestern part of the state. Absolutely. But in terms of the effect on bees that it has, um, if it is indeed a pheromone, then I would say it's likely very minimal to, to none at all. Well, but, that's what I have known associated with splat. Is, is that correct, Mike? Is that, um, or is- Yeah, it is a pheromone. Okay, um, and it should have minimal bees. effects on bees then. Right. Uh, they may be thinking back to, I know at one time, the NCDA was using uh, a growth regulator, diflubenzeron or dimelin. And that, of course, has a broader impact on a lot of things, how it affects bees. You know, again, same thing there if you contaminate nectar or something. Um, but that's, that's the reason why they have to uh, file that elaborate game plan every year. Oh, with I see. Spring to okay. account for those kinds of environmental impacts. Well, it's just another good example of where, you know, there um, are different issues, right, that need to be weighed and balanced. And the best way to arrive at that kind of goldie, Goldilocks optimum is uh, um, transparency and as much information as you can, right? So uh, the, these guys um, are, are really, really excellent resources for all of that. Um, well, you know, I think what we'll do is we'll... Um, We'll ask, uh, answer a couple other questions. There are other questions talking about uh, winterizing and whatnot. Um, so uh, there's one question about using the candy boards for feeding solid sugar to bees during winter. Um, Jan, if you're still around, do you want to take that? Uh, I don't think we use that a whole lot in our research apiaries, but um, I know that especially when it's colder out, um, you don't wanna be using liquid sugar feed to the bees because then they can't really dry it out very well. Um, and so those candy boards certainly can be very beneficial. And then I think they also, uh, they store longer um, rather than uh, um, the, the liquid feeds. And so that's certainly an option. But my philosophy in going into it is that um, you don't really need to be feeding so much through the winter if you make sure that they have enough honey going into winter, right? So just make sure that they have plenty of stores up front, be proactive about it, and using those, um, you know, uh, candy boards or, or other things during and through the winter is really more of a triage issue, and hopefully uh, you wouldn't really need to, to get to that point. Um, there's another question here about um, uh, double screen uh, boards in order to overwinter. And so what's, that's a really good point and a good question. 
where it's talking about or saying how you can unite two kind of weaker colonies together um, to make one stronger colony that will have a higher chance of making it through the winter that you can then split the next year. Another way to do it, rather than you actually uniting the colonies themselves and having them all in one colony in one hive, you can have them in one hive, but still have two colonies. And so in essence, what you can do is have this double screen, which is kind of like an inner cover, but it has um, two screens where the air, the hot air from below can rise up to the top, but the bees don't inter intermix. They can't um, interact with each other and therefore you know, take offense to each other. And so you can have a strong colony down below and their kind of hot air that that um, cluster is, is making can then rise up and then warm up a smaller colony that's above that, that double screen. And that can be a really effective way too. And, and again, then come next spring, you split the two off. So that is a, a certainly another option, requires extra um, wooden wear and pieces of equipment. But if you have it and you wanna try it, uh, absolutely, that can be a, 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 very effective, um, a very effective strategy. Um, let's see, there's uh, another question here about uh, oxalic uh, treatments for varroa mites, either using the acid uh, vaporizer with a thermostat or without a thermostat. Um, uh, Don or Lewis or um, uh, John, do I, any of you guys want to take I'm that? Sure. I tend to shy away from using those uh, um, atomizers in the first place, but um, I think you have to be very careful with temperatures. If it's if it's not uh, hot enough, it's not going to be effective. If it's too hot, it's not going to be effective. It could be uh, damaging to the bees. So I see some really shady uh, application methods out there, and I would really urge everyone to. Um, so you would recommend stick a thermostat to, at the very some, least? Stick to some store-bought, tried-and-true type stuff. I've seen some really, um, what I think is bad practice, kind of backyard shop shenanigans as far as applicators go, and I'd like to strongly discourage that type of behavior. Don? I, I would completely agree with what Lewis just said. Yeah. You, you can hurt yourself with that stuff. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I, I shy away from it too, at least. Um, I mean, I think if you are going to, you know, turn it into a vapor, then using the, as I'm hearing, using a thermostat, but uh, be, be very, very cautious and make sure you use it a, a labeled product. Right? Dave, also, if there's, they need to have very little to no brood. So it's got to be sort of Correct. like later in the winter because a lot of the bees right now still have a lot of brood yep. and that's not touching anything under the cappings where most of the mites are. That's a great point. And in fact, did we cover that in our apiculture online a couple sessions ago when we were talking about, you know, the different options for, for mite uh, control? Um, I think we were talking about that, that it really has to be broodless. You're right. Go ahead, Don. I think you did mention it, but but again, it, it, it's certainly worth re-emphasizing. You know, so many people are treating with the vapor throughout the, the brood rearing period and wondering why their mite levels are still high. Yeah. Well, and that's why, because it, it, yeah. uh, it doesn't <laughs> penetrate the cappings. Um, right. So yeah. here, I'm going to, I'm going to put the, uh, the link to that uh, YouTube video in, uh, in our chat. Well, I'll put it in the YouTube chat because nobody can see it on the otherwise. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, um, unless anybody else has anything else to add, again, I want to thank uh, our guests, Mike Walvogel and Sydney Ross. Um, you guys both did a, a great job, very, very informative about um, uh, backyard and other uh, mosquito spraying and what we as beekeepers really need to, to bear in mind when it comes to um, keeping our bees safe. Um, I want to end by reminding everybody that um, we're doing these every other week. Uh, and so we'll do this in another two weeks where um, we're going to have uh, our guest interviewee is uh, Dr. Casey Raymond, who's at a, a relatively new hire 
um, in the biology department there at UNC Greensboro. And she does a lot of work. She's a microbiologist by training, but she works um, in honeybees and has done a lot with both um, pathogenic microbes as well as the beneficial gut microbiome and other interesting things. So we're gonna have a chat with her. And then um, next time we are gonna also talk about doing that feeding kind of for and through the winter, um, kind of as we touched on today. Until then, uh, thank you again. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, like us and comment, and uh, we'd like to see you next time. Thanks again.